Hey, everybody. Um, it's Bob Ost. It's Theater Resources Unlimited True Community Gathering. Uh, it's today is uh, July. <laughs> never, I'm so bad with the date. July 15th. It's July 15th. Originally, they were a response to COVID. They were a way for us to get people together and, and help people feel less isolated by being in a room together to talk about theater and art and what they're doing and what they're up to and um, talk about their feelings even and talk about the frustrations with shutdown. Um, here we are two and a half years since the shutdown, oh. March 15th, 2020. Um, <laughs> Who, who ever thought uh, that we would be in shutdown for as long as we were? I mean, I, I thought that the worst case scenario would be like six months or something. Uh, how wrong was I? How wrong were we all? Mm. Um, but here we are. We're now coming out of shutdown. We, so we've conquered aspects of COVID. Uh, COVID is no longer as deadly. Uh, we have vaccinations now. So we have a lot of people that are have protection against illness, not necessarily protection against getting COVID because COVID doesn't care about the vaccine. It will enter your body and make you test positive anyway. I've had that happen twice. Um, but at least now there are, there, are, there are treatments for it. There are ways of dealing with it. It's not as deadly as it once was. Uh, two and a half years ago was a nightmare for all of us. I think we all can agree with that. The, there are a few things that we can all agree on in, in this world and in this country these days, but I think we can all agree that COVID was a nightmare of some form for everyone. Now we are no longer required to have masks, except I think New York just instituted a new mask mandate. I don't know the details of it. Uh, we can go out and, and be in live performances and live events, and we can eat out and do all these things like normal life. We're still vulnerable, so I don't want anybody to be, you know, cavalier about this and say, oh, well, no, nothing's going to happen. Something could happen, but the likelihood that you're going to be gravely ill is very, very, very low likelihood, unless you have underlying conditions. And you know, you know what you can take and what you can't take. You know yourself better than, than anybody knows you. So um, let's all be careful. Uh, our conversations since April 17th, 2020 have changed, obviously, uh, now that we're in a different world, a more uh, alive world now. We, we've talked about creating art in isolation. We've talked about virtual presentations and platforms and hybrid theater. We're actually going to still continue to talk about hybrid theater because I mean, I've got already booked a couple things coming up that are going to be talking about a balancing virtual and live performance. Today, we're going to talk about legal issues. We're going to talk about the law. Uh, so the, the law isn't necessarily hasn't been subject to COVID. So the, I, I think maybe some laws and contracts and equity uh, and other places and the other unions may have morphed and changed and shifted, shape shifted over the past two years. But there are certain legal basics that are that are truth and are basically things that we need to follow and understand as we navigate the business, the business of theater and the business of film. I'd like to have comparisons between film and theater every now and then because a lot of us get very lost in theater and we forget that there are other areas out there that we can actually delve into and and it's good to know how they work. So I've got two attorneys here today. So I'm gonna to have to behave very well because I got two attorneys here today. And uh, I want to introduce you to them. Um, one is on the West Coast and one is on the East Coast. Looking at them, can you tell which is which? I will let you know. Mm. Representing LA, Team LA, Gordon Firemark. Representing Team New York, Lee Feldshawn. Yay. So, um, <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yourselves and your backgrounds first. Let's start with let's start with LA because I don't know you as well, Gordon. Lee and okay, I hi Bob. So friends. I am um, Gordon Firemark. I've been practicing entertainment law here in Los Angeles for about thirty years. Uh, got got uh, going with my law practice in nineteen ninety two, ninety three, and um, 
I've always had a passion for theater. So I, you know, even though I was on the West Coast, I let it be known that theater uh, is important to me. And I was very fortunate to get some theatrical clients, some of the you know, out here in LA, we have a lot of very small theaters, actually quite quite a large number of small theaters. And uh, I've had the great pleasure of helping some of those theater companies to, uh, uh, to manage their operations and independent producers to produce their shows and things like that. Also so, uh, do- quick, quick question though. Are we gonna be able to talk about a comparison of, of small theater out there and small theater here in New York? Cause that would be, that would be an interesting point. We hadn't talked about talking about that. Certainly, yeah, um, we can we can weave that in. Okay. Uh, but you know, I also do film and television and uh, I've gotten very excited about digital media, especially podcasting and YouTube kinds of stuff in the last, uh, oh, I don't know, 10 years or so. So uh, I am, I'm, uh, I guess I'm an early adopter and a little bit of a techno geek. So that's part of the fun for me there. So anyway, I'm really glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, glad to have you. Uh, I get lots of emails from you. This guy also is like the, the, the guy that sends out legal theater uh, theater and film legal essays like once what is it once a week oh I, you know a couple of times a month is, is sort of the goal some weeks i'm busy and i've got something to say and sometimes i have to scrape the bottom of the barrel to come up with content but i try to put things out two or three times a month yes i know the feeling mm -hmm. um so lee felchon um haven't seen you in a while but we're pretty good friends so it's good to have you Good to be here, and uh, I hope I can uh, I can live up to Gordon's fantastic radio voice here. So uh, I don't know if I can, but it's great to be here, Bob. Um, I am an entertainment attorney in New York. I have my own firm, I'm a solo practitioner, or as I could say, three people firm, me, myself, and I. Um, I'm also uh, an expat from the large law firm scene, started off at White and Case many years ago, then eventually found my way in-house in into Madison Square Garden Radio City Entertainment for a spell. But now I enjoy having running my own shindig, and doing lots and lots and lots of theater. Very, very tiny bit of film from a long time ago. So Gordon, I'm definitely glad you're here to handle the film part. And uh, it's just great to be able to, um, to talk with you all. Happy Friday, everybody. So guys, um, it's I call it the theater film crossover and I've been doing these for 15 years. I try to do at least one a year because people in theater uh, always are interested in learning the language uh, of film because things are called different things in, in film the film world. Things work a little differently in the film world. So trying to give everybody a sense of how what we do in theater is done in film uh, is always something that I'm interested in, in presenting to people. So given that is one of the basic ideas that we want to deal with here, uh, let's start with let's start with the with the very basic. Uh, for me it's a basic because I think that Film and theater both start with the work, and th that's that's the starting point for for the conversation as well. Uh, the work is looked at differently in theater and film, so let's let's talk about that a little bit. Um, ownership and all that. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll start running with that one. Um, you know, as most theater folk know, authorship is ownership. So when a playwright sits down and writes a play, when a, a team, a, a, a book writer, lyricist, and composer sit down and write their show, they own what they've created from the very outset. With film, that is not always the case. Now, when the screenwriter sits down and writes something on spec, just had an idea and they wrote it and out it goes, yes, they are the author and they own it right up until the moment that it is sold to a producer. And uh, from that point on, it is the property of the producer, generally speaking. So, and when a, a writer is hired by a producer to craft a, a screenplay, unlike in the theatrical commission arena where you would expect that the playwright will still own the work when they're done, the, the screenwriter is doing the work under a provision of copyright law called the work made for hire clause. And that means that the employer, the, the studio, the producer, is the owner of the work from its very inception with much less um, later on for the author, the, the screenwriter, to, uh, to own and partake of or, or share in. So uh, I'd say that's one of the most fundamental differences between theater and film. And the reason that it exists as a difference is that the, the actual description of what is a work made for hire 
uh, articulates certain kinds of works that outside of a traditional employment relationship can be created under this provision. And dramatic, dramatico and dramatico musical works are not among, among the list of works that that can be done with. So you see theatrical producers um, handling things a little differently and uh, sometimes getting creative <laughs> about how they approach it. Write me a screenplay that I can turn into a theater piece, you know, those kinds of things. So, 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 so Lee, uh, take it from the from the theater point of view, so that people are clear clear about. That. I mean, most people in this room should know some of this, but if they, in case they don't, let's let's talk about options and and, and the, the basic reason why the question that would come up in a writer's mind is why do I give up my authorship and allow a studio to take over authorship of my work? Um, and there's a very simple reason for that. I think it's I think it's money. Money yeah. helps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, in in in, in theater, what's the old adage? The the author is king. Um, so the author will get to uh, control the property, own the property, have a lot of different approvals over it. That in film, as Gordon pointed out, gets sacrificed. It's the producer who's 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 basically buying that property. So in, in theater, when the author creates the play or the musical, and you're looking to get someone to actually put it on stage for you, you mentioned options, Bob. So you'd enter into an agreement with a producer to give that producer certain rights and a certain time period for a certain amount of money and lots of other certain, certain, certains to be able to, to put the show on stage and, um, and to get out there in front of audiences. And that contract is called an option agreement or it's sometimes called a production rights agreement or production rights contract. And it's a very, very important agreement that really sets the, sets the stage, if you will, for how the relationship between the producer and the author is going to work. So the, 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 the uh, producer has to fulfill certain, certain basic things in order to fulfill the terms of, of an option agreement. Um, so he doesn't, he doesn't option it for life. Um, Gordon, what happens when a studio buys a script? Is there any commitment to have to what they have to do? Or can you can you negotiate an agreement where if they don't do anything with the script, you get the rights back? Yeah, so so typically, we, we'd also use option agreements in, in film, but unlike in theater where the option is usually sort of exercised by the opening of the doors for a production, in film, it's exercised by the payment of money. So you might buy an option a short term, 18 months, maybe two years, in which to develop and produce, you know, and get the, the film made or get it to the point of, of green lighting a production, at which point the producer pays the purchase price for the, for the material and then owns it generally in perpetuity, um, whether they actually make the film or not. Now, there is a, a, a provision that we often try for and, and uh, sophisticated experienced established screenwriters with some credibility and cr and clout are able to negotiate for what's called a, a reversion right or usually it's done as a turnaround and the turnaround provision is the rights revert after a certain amount of time if the producer has done nothing but in the turnaround it means that the the uh, the owner the, the the screenwriter has to get a commitment from another producer to pay the first producer what's been spent on developing the production, so they, you know, end up coming out even, <laughs> supposedly. So, is, um, so is the, is the person that is the studio or the producer that? Oh, and let's talk about the difference between a studio and a producer in terms of sure. in terms of how the, how that works in the in your in your end of the business. Um, so, is the studio or the producer required to demonstrate how they've what they've spent on 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 something? I mean. How, how, how do you get? How do you find that out? Oh, sure. Well, yeah, they would have to tell you. You're, you know, if you're if you're going to exercise this turnaround right, you're basically saying, "I want to buy the property back." How much have you spent? They've got to be able to show you, you know, proper records and documents and and accounting records. Of course, uh, we all know the the history of Hollywood accounting is anything but transparent and fair. <laughs> so that's unfortunately, what was, that's what was worrying me as we're talking about this. Yeah. I mean, generally a, a film that hasn't actually been produced there, you know, the development money, how much did you pay the screenwriters? How much did you develop a, a storyboard artist or, or whatever? How much did you pay for rights and, and hiring, doing rewrites and those kinds of things? 
um, it's fairly easy to sort of keep an eye on, you know, they didn't spend millions of dollars frivolously and, and those kinds of things. So it's sort of hard to pad the, the bill there. But you do see interest and, and overhead charges and things like that coming out of a studio from the day they spend the first dollar on a project. So, um, But they wouldn't, they wouldn't be required. The, the second producer wouldn't be required to pick up the tab on, on the option money that they paid the writer. I mean, that, yes, that, they would. Really? Yeah, it's all rolled into the oh, good purchase Lord, price. That, yeah. That's so... Ooh, that's icky. Yeah. Again, depending on the negotiation, the, the writer may be able to exclude those kinds of things from the calculus, but that's going to depend on your bargaining power and clout. In, that's in... shocking. You'll see, you're paying an option for the, for the, for the right. You're, mm -hmm. you're valuing the writer. You're valuing his work, and you're paying for the work. And if you spent two years or three years or five years and you haven't been able to make it happen, you still, mm -hmm. the... The, the work still has its value. So I don't, that's terrible. And, and I own it now because I purchased the rights. Now, you know, if, if the option expires without the purchase happening, then the rights do revert to the author right away, to the screenwriter. It's, it's only in the scenario where they've paid the purchase price, which may be a million dollars or, or you know, many, uh, many hundreds of thousands of dollars for a purchase price for the film, at which point, something falls through, the actor dies and they can't make the movie or, or circumstances change at the studio and the new studio boss doesn't like that particular project or whatever. That's the scenario where the turnaround kicks in is after the purchase has actually been And Don Loft, Donald Loftus wants to know, are the writer's words at all protected or is the purchaser free to do whatever they want with the script? Hey, hey Gordon, isn't it true that some studios will buy a script just to shelve it? Oh, yes. Yes, yeah, so sorry, sorry to become even more distasteful here for you, Bob, but that happens too. Yeah, and so, so one of the, explain, explain that in case anybody doesn't. Yeah, understand. one of I the know. one of the red flags that you look for is when they're lowballing on the purchase price because they, you know, you just don't have a sense that they're really intending to make this movie. They're intending to buy it to prevent it from being made because they have something else in the pipeline or something like that. So they'll, they'll lowball the option prices and make it as long as possible. You know, we want three years and then we'll renew it for another three years and then we'll purchase it for, you know, a minimum of $50,000. And then, you know, sometimes they'll, they'll tease you by saying, or, or a percentage of the budget, whichever is larger, if they're never going to make the movie, they don't care because the budget's not going to happen. So, um, Okay. Yeah, so that that's a big one. But uh, back to Don's Donald's question about are the writer's words at all protected? Uh, you know, no. <laughs> I, I mean, to be blunt, not really. Uh, that's more a function of of morality and ethics between the writer and the producer and the nature of that relationship. But there's no shortage of of screenplays that have been bought and turned into something radically different. And the title and the main, you know, the key story points are the same, but it's no longer really the same material. And, uh, you know, this, the screenwriter is uh, uh, left outside looking in on what was done by rewrites and things like that. Oftentimes we'll try to negotiate a deal where the original screenwriter gets at least the first crack at rewriting if the producer and the director want it rewritten. But at some point they're going to say, no, we need to take it in this different direction. And, and once they purchase it, they're free to go, free to do it. Lee, talk about how that how it happens in theater, because it's it's different. It's definitely not the uh, upside down world from Stranger Things, that's for sure. Uh, but it's uh, no in 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 theater again. The the author has a lot of approval rights, so any changes to uh, to the script of the play or any changes to the book, the music, and the lyrics have to be approved by the authors and also co-approved by the producer, right? Because the producer is going to pay an option fee to get a certain property. And the producer's not going to want the author to suddenly say, "Oh, I'm going to make turn this comedy into a tragedy, and let's have let's make it horror horror genre." So there's got to be a check and balance with that. But yeah, it, I mean, the authors still maintain a lot of control. But in okay. fairness, the economic leverage often still works to force that playwright's hand, doesn't it? If the A-list director and the and the you know seasoned Broadway producer want to go in a particular direction, they can twist the the writer's arm pretty hard, can't they? Yeah, no, no, they can't. I was trying to take a 30,000 foot view, but you're right. Sure. If you come and start focusing on it, there are a lot of different power dynamics in terms of uh, the standing of all the parties, like who has more clout and just how, what are the reputations? But again, this all comes down to negotiating leverage, right? Yeah. Just how much clout does the writer have? How much clout does the producer have? 
but still there are, at least there are institutionalized <laughs> these approvals that the author will still maintain. And, and what's really interesting about that is that they're institutionalized in theater, largely because of the ownership of the copyright, I think. But in theater, the Dramatists Guild isn't a union. It doesn't have the ability to collectively bargain on behalf of playwrights. But in film, the Screenwriters Guild, the, 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 Drama, the Writers Guild of America, excuse me, is a union that theoretically has that power. But here we've sort of seen it go the other way. It's just an interesting... Yeah, in, sp in, spite of having, in spite of having the power... Uh, the screenwriters uh, union is less able to f fight fights for the writers than than the dramatist guild. The dramatist guild has has a certain amount of clout here. Uh, oh yeah. The, uh, there's a sta there's standard dramatist guild agreements for at least Broadway. I'm not even sure if it's off Broadway, but the Broadway contracts are standard dramatist guild agreements. Um, where, where, where are the other where do the other agreements come from and can you tell us some of the basics of the of the dramatist guild agreement well i mean the dramatist guild agreement that i'm most familiar with would be on, on the broadway level it's called the approved production contract and so really any first class production of a show although i guess more so if the author is a member of the dramatist guild that really helps although there are producers out there who will who will agree to follow the apc the approved production contract but there might, they might make some exceptions about certain things. I mean, when I'm, whenever I'm representing producers and optioning a piece from the writers, and if it's gonna be a second class option, but with a first class option for an option, if you will, that if they do wanna take it to Broadway, then in the second class option agreement for the off-Broadway production, it'll say the producers choose to take it to Broadway, they'll execute an approved production contract, but exclude certain things, like having perhaps having the, having the dramatist go review the contract or arbitration or, or, or mediation through the dramatist guild and there's certain there's certain uh, provisions that that producer try to take out and in part because the approved production contract hasn't changed in many 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 years it is it is old so so it doesn't really quite has been quite changed with the times but it's the apc would definitely control most of most of the broadway issues for a broadway production of, of a show of a play or a musical they're two separate agreements one for and, each and just just touch on some of the basics of, of the agreement and the and subsidiary rights and uh, royalties and and all that sure well, would it be helpful if i sort of drew back a little bit and just talked about these provisions and option agreements in in general as opposed sure. to just for, sure for and then i'm going to ask gordon what what they have in in the film world Okay. Where sure. do, oh, Gordon, where do, where do contracts come from? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a stork that no. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but in a, sort of, in, it's in a sort of a generic option agreement. You're going to have the option. What are the rights being optioned? Is it for, for second class in New York, meaning off Broadway? Is it for, for regional productions, for Lort productions, League of Residential Theaters, or regional theaters? Um, Will it be in just the North, North America, or will it be something that starts in in the United Kingdom? So, do you need to have the the right? Does the producer have to have the right to include the UK as part of the initial what's called the initial territory for the first production of the show? The option agreement will also have a period of time as to how much time the the producer has to actually to actually you know option the piece and to, produce, to exercise the option of the piece and to put the, put the show on. There will also be some extension periods for the option. And there'll be an option price. So generally, sort of the sweet spot for, for you know, just for a writer who's not necessarily a famous writer, but maybe who's not an absolute beginner either, for second class is somewhere around, I see a lot of five thousand dollars or around around that price, or could be could be higher as well. Um, then you also have in the option agreement uh, the royalty. So there, there are other payments that get made to the authors as well. So the royalty is some percentage of basically the gross receipts, what's called gross weekly box office receipts in theater, which are the ticket revenues, then there are these certain standardized deductions that get made to that to get the gross weekly box office receipts. And then in, for example, for a musical for a second class production, off Broadway production, it tends to be about 6% gross of a gross royalty that goes up to 7% upon recoupment. Recoupment being that the producer has to raise money from investors. The investors put the money in the show. And then as the show is running and hopefully making money, whatever monies are made in excess of the weekly, uh, the weekly operating expenses of the show will go to the investors until they recoup, right? But part, part of that, uh, part of one of those payments of those expenses is to pay the royalties. So recoupment is when the investors have made all their money back and then you're into what's called adjusted net profits or, or net profits. 
And then at that point, the, the royalty for the author for a musical for second class production would go up to 7%. For first class productions, it's under the APC, the pre-production contract, it'd be four and a half going up to 6%. For, for plays, it it's I see a lot of, of plays that are around 10% or, or lower. Uh, so, but again, you're gonna have to pay some sort of a royalty. So that's gonna be an option agreement. Then to, just to quickly sort of sum up a little bit, there's gonna be an important uh, provision called merger which applies to musicals, which basically means you've got the book, the music and the lyrics of a musical. At some point they become married to each other. So they can't be used in some other relationship out there. They can't be used in another, another production of a musical. So that's gonna be in there. Then there'll be, there'll be uh, additional territory options for what other territories can a producer produce the show in and what has to happen before they, before they can do that. Uh, subsidiary rights participation is a big provision in the option agreement. What that means is that the authors of a show, producer options it, they're doing, they're doing commercial productions of it, but there are other ways to exploit the show as well. The show might be made into, meaning the show being the play or the music might be made into a movie, or maybe there's a sequel or a prequel that gets made at some point, or there's some sort of a concert version. So these are other rights that the author has to be able to exploit that work. But in the subsidiary rights, um, provision, basically there's a schedule that if the producer presents a certain number of performances of a certain type of the show, then they will trigger a participation in the income that the author makes from those other subsidiary rights exploitations. And that's and, very and important. Let, let, let me, I always like to clarify this for writers who, sure. who, who let that sort of go over their head and they, uh, they don't really think about it. You actually, in, in exchange for a producer spending millions of dollars uh, on your on your production and giving your production value, you are agreeing to allow them to participate in your income after the play has has been performed for a, a certain amount of time. Uh, that includes licensing. That includes subsidiary, subsidiary oh, rights. The, the 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 producer and the producing company um, will will share with you your 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 money. So a lot of people go no no oh my god. But it really makes sense because it's the producer is spending so much money, so much time and energy, and, and there's so many people giving your property value that it might not have otherwise. Um, and your way of saying thank you is saying, yes, you may share with my in my income of, of, of future versions of my show. Yes, but so even more than just saying thank you, right? you have the producer has to raise money from investors. And as we know, most shows, the great overwhelming majority of shows don't recoup, certainly not from the, certainly not from the production run. So there have to be these other, these other rivers of re revenues that come in that will help the investors recoup over time. If that wasn't there, then it'd be hard to get people to invest in theater. I'm gonna to segue to Gordon and I'm gonna come back to questions from Phil and, and Donald and Marlene, but what, if any of this, applies to the, the agreement that's, agreements that are done in the film world? You're, you're on mute. I know because I, I'm not hearing that lovely booming voice. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, with a screenplay that was originally written on spec and being sold to a film producer or, or a studio, it is often possible for the author or screenwriter to reserve certain rights, maybe the right to do print publication, to turn it into a novel uh, or a book, or to um, sometimes the legit stage rights are reserved to the screenwriter. But that that's, again, a function of bargaining power and and clout and often has a, a connection to how much money you're looking for on the on the purchase price and those kinds of things. In the in the writer for hire scenario, it's, it's just not going to happen. The uh, uh, the, the screenwriter is creating it for someone else and it belongs to them and they're getting paid. Just as a factory worker is building that car for the Ford Motor Company, they don't get to collect a, a, a royalty every time the car is resold or, or those kinds of things. So Lee, uh, Lee talked about a, a $5,000 option, uh, just, mm -hmm. as a, just as a random figure because it's, it's it, anything yeah. is, in, everything in theater is a negotiation. I don't know if everything in film is a negotiation as well. It's, it sounds sure. like there were a lot of there are a lot of restrictions in terms of what you can negotiate. But what is what are they paying you uh, in in film? 
you know, it, it's such a wide range. And, and one of the things we have to keep in mind when we're talking about a film is there are movies that are made for $250,000. And then there are movies that are made for $250 million. <laughs> so it's this big, broad range. Now, a general um, notion of what an option for a, a screenplay is, uh, it, it could be anywhere from a few hundred dollars for a year's worth of option period to, you know, the neighborhood of five or even ten thousand dollars isn't isn't extraordinary. Um, the Writers Guild does promulgate a set of minimums for the purchase prices of these things. And their guideline is that the option price ought to be 10% or so of the purchase price. And so that puts us in the neighborhood of, for low budget films, low budget meaning under five million um, Purchase prices, I think, are in the low eighty thousand dollars these days. So you'd be looking at paying somewhere around eight thousand dollars for an option. Eight thousand um, or eighty thousand. Eight. Eight. The 000. purchase price would be eighty. Oh, the option is eight, and the, the purchase price is eight. Right, right. So, okay. so you use ten percent of that as a figure. You know, in, in the independent, lower budget arenas, we see smaller numbers generally, and uh, um. And, and yeah, so uh, it, it's not that far off, really, from what Lee was talking about. But there are a lot of other avenues of compensation that can come to a screenwriter as well, right, Gordon, in terms sure. of uh, bonuses and, and um, if there are TV series that are made. Uh, like well, uh, yes, sometimes. Again, you know, there are what we call passive payments. If this project is turned into a this, if there's a sequel, if there's a remake, if there's a TV series, those kinds of things. Uh, yeah, absolutely, there can be. Um, additional streams of, of of income that are usually just a fixed percentage of what was paid for the original. Sometimes there's also consulting or producing work on the project. Sometimes just credit in name and credit and compensation, and sometimes it's really showing up and doing the work of producing the show as well. So yeah, there are definitely additional um, points that may be negotiated again, depending on the bargaining power and relationships of the parties and so on. Absolutely. So Phil, Phil also wants to know what credit can the playwright get other than based on the play by if their play is adapted into a screenplay by someone else? Uh, I, I assume that that's negotiable. But what, what are, the, what are, are there any standards? It's not as negotiable as one might think. Um, the, the specific wording of the based on the play by or based on characters and scenarios created by, you know, those kinds of things, you can, you can massage that a little bit. But because we have a union with a collective bargain agreement between screenwriters and, uh, and producers, the things like the story by, the written by, screenplay by, those kinds of credits are, uh, are narrowly governed by the, the Writers Guild Minimum Basic Agreement. A, a playwright of, of uh, a certain reputation and, and uh, clout, I guess, could negotiate maybe some producing credit or something else like that or consulting kind of credits. But the literary work itself is going to be pretty narrowly tailored to that Mar from the playboy. Mar Marlene Thorne Tabor wants to know, what about publication rights and foreign language rights in terms of maintaining the author's original work? Um, are they giving up the rights to their to the property completely when they... The screenwriter? They, yeah. G generally, yes. Now, again, a a when the screenwriter brings the idea or the script to the studio or producer, that screenwriter will also have something called separated rights, which does reserve certain uh, print publication and uh, stage rights to the author. Um, but that's a, a somewhat narrow circumstance when it's originally, you know, characters originally created by this person, if they're translating into another, one of these other media, then yeah, the the buyer of those rights for that other medium would have to deal directly with the screenwriter. But um, I think I missed one of the questions. Well, Don, Donald of... asks a question that I, I'm not sure is something that actually happens. Mm -hmm. if, if a pro production has been on Broadway, um, do movie producers who copy any element from the, of, the, of the production of, of the show have to uh, compensate the original creators? I, I don't know that they ever do. I guess it's... That's a real question. Like Chicago, the movie of Chicago did did use some Fosse esque type movement, but it, it it feels like the the movie is a very separate creation from the from the stage play. I don't know whether but I'm thinking like something like say Hello Dolly, that where the stage the stage production was you know with the feathers and the red dress and it was like so um, iconic. Mm -hmm iconic you know or hamilton 
if they turn that into a movie, do they do the uh, costume designers, the set designers, are they at all compensated when a movie is made? Do they copy them? If the wardrobe item or the scenic design item that is that, that's being copied is really genuinely the same, you know, or, or substantially similar from the play to the movie, then yeah, I think so. Um, and if again, if there's a sort of overall design sensibility that is brought over, I think you might you might also see that. But most of the time, the scenic and the wardrobe people for the film are going to do their jobs from the what's on the page rather than what they've seen. But at least that that's going to be the the goal, um, you know, being true to the original, but again, original in your own way in the scene. Donald, Donald, it's sort of like two different productions of, of a show. And this is the Joe Mantello story. Ba yeah, basically, right. basically it's uh, Love, Valor, and Compassion was din done on a production in New York, and it was a very specific production with a very specific vision from a very specific director, Joe Mantello. Then a, a company in Florida um, did the play, but they copied one one element, which was the opening, I think it was the, the, the small house on the stage that represented the large house that everybody was li living in. And they, I think they lost that, That uh, Joe won that. Uh, he, he said, that's my idea, you can't use it. Um, so any, if, if, a, if a producer, if a movie producer so blatantly uses a creative aspect of a Broadway show um, and doesn't compensate the original designer or creator, then they're opening themselves up to a lawsuit that they'll probably, I think, lose these days. I'm not sure. What do you think, Lee? Yeah, I mean, well, it's copyright ownership over over those design elements, and so I would think the film producer would have to get the rights if they're if they're going to use those exact elements. Not something that's sort of in the same ballpark. It sort of gets it gets that becomes a sort of a question, I think, for the courts as to what is substantially similar. Does it really copy it or not? But I would think. I mean, the, the dollhouse, the dollhouse in Florida was not identical to the dollhouse in, in the New York production. But the idea, which was not in the script, was something that, that Joe Mattella brought into it. The idea was so specific that it was subject to uh, to, to, to law, to legal action uh, in that one instance. It, oh. it, it happens. And that raises an interesting question in copyright law that, you know, copyright doesn't protect ideas. It right. protects the specific ways we express an idea. So the the case with Mantello and, and Love, Valor, Compassion, that is a real, I, I wouldn't call it exactly an outlier, but it stands for this idea of a directorial copyright in their stage direction. And the the law doesn't really go that far most of the time. It would have to be something very distinctive and... and um, an original that made its way onto this into the stage production, that um, that is then copied in a substantial similar way for the film or the later production or whatever. Um, the other thing we have to keep in mind is that copyright is, there's this concept of sort of a thin copyright for things like the design of a dress or a wardrobe item or something like that. And if the if the script calls for Dolly to enter the stage wearing a large brimmed hat and a feather boa, then the color and shape of the feather bow or the length of the feather bow, you know, those kinds of things, that's not really going to go very far in terms of protection. Likewise, if the set, if the, if the stage direction on the page calls for Tony to climb the fire escape to sing to Maria, what the fire escape looks like is sort of limited by what fire escapes look like. So, um, so well, there, there are, there are other questions. Well, an easy one from Emma is, Lee, do, do subsidiary rights in theater have a fixed time limit? Um, and Hi. there, there is a schedule. There is a schedule, and it's in the contract. And it, 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 it just, it does change from con from agreement to agreement. It's what you negotiate. Right. Well, the approved the approved production contract in advance, I think, has two or three different scenarios you can choose from with different time periods for different little sticks of subsidiary rights that are in the bundle. For uh, for a second class production, it's just another point that gets negotiated between the um, the producer and the authors as to whether or not subsidiary rights exploitation um, is ten years or fifteen. I mean. Normally, for, for shows that are branded in New York, it, it tends to be around 10, 20 is a little bit long, and, we'll, and, and the, um, the author's attorney will fight against that. So somewhere between 10 and 20, maybe 18, try to push it as much as you can, depending on which side of, if you're, if you're representing producers, and try to push it as, for as long as you can, obviously. 
So I, I, I don't want to leave un questions unanswered, but I do want to get to finances. I want to, I want to talk about the producer side of it, and we, we won't have as much time. I know, Lee, you have to, you have to leave at 6.40. I, so. can, I can hang for a bit. Oh, you can? Okay. Sure. Um, Gordon, or can we, can we, because I okay. think it's going to take a little bit of time to talk about the producers and the financial sure. aspect of it as well. So let's, let, let's switch to the producer's point of view and Jeffrey Lyle Siegel, we'll come back to your question at the end and we'll, we'll try to cover any of the other questions. Marine Condon asks a very interesting question, but I, it's, it's, I, it's, it's more weeds right now. Um, so now we're going to look, look at it from the point of view of the producer or the studios. First of all, Gordon, can you, can you tell us a little bit about the difference in the in the business model f between a studio production and, a, and and an independent production? Um, Other than the cost, <laughs> I was going to say orders of magnitude in dollars yeah. mainly. I'd say that's the big difference. But what that difference drives is different ways that you go about accumulating, raising that money. In the low budget arena, it's very similar to what you see in theatrical Ooh. stage financing, and. When you get into the range where you're into the multi tens of millions of dollars, it starts to get much more complicated. And there's lots and lots of moving parts to the deals in the studio arena. And, and there are independent movies that are made for 50 and 100 million dollars. But in the studio arena, you've got this giant corporation that is essentially a financing business. It's a, it, they're, they're a financial services company that happens to own real estate that's dedicated to making movies. They happen to own a lot of facilities and equipment that's dedicated to making movies that they rent to the movie producers to use. So they are, but they're also putting up the money and they're acting in many ways like a bank. It's, they're putting this money into the budget of the movie and they're gonna get paid interest and and uh, overhead charges and all kinds of other things from the uh, the revenues before anybody else sees anything from that. So let me and, just clarify that, just make sure I understand that. You're saying that in the, in the big studio, uh, what what happens? They're not going out and raising money for films. They they have they have a reserve of money, uh, or be, because they're set up as a business, they have a a pool of money that they use. Or do they have to raise additional funds ever? It depends. Um, I think sometimes, it, well, generally speaking, they have their coffers of funds that are available for for uh, spending on these kinds of things. After all, they are publicly, many of them are publicly traded or owned by publicly traded companies, and there's, you know, stock valuations and all that kind of thing. They do, and they have credit lines, and you know, they're, they're, it's sophisticated financial management is what's going on at the, at this level. Just like any sort of factory business, they have to spend money to make money, so they. They deposit, they use their resources. Um, however, when they're making these multi-hundred million dollar tentpole movies, they are often trying to do what they can to spread some of the risk and in so doing also share some of the, uh, the rewards, of course. And so they'll do co-productions with a foreign company, sometimes because there's a tax incentive available in that, in that foreign country. Uh, they'll do... Um, there's some insurance-backed kinds of mechanisms that they can do. They can they can even issue some bonds and things like that for a particular you know, earmarked for certain projects. But essentially, it's it's as though they were going and spending their own money most of the time. When we see opening credits that list like six to eight to ten different mm -hmm. producing co production companies, what what world are we in at that point? Is is that the is that the, the big studio or? It, it could be, it, and, and, and the big studios are also in the film distribution business, so they're, they're integrated sort of vertically in, in providing everything from the nail that's used to build the set all the way up to you know, getting, the theater, getting the movie into the theater in Liechtenstein and everything in between. Um, and so what you're seeing when you see that multiple, those multiple producing credits is sometimes the studio's credit, well, always the studio's credit is there, the distributor, the studio, and there may be multiple producers. You know, sometimes um, the director also has a company that is considered a producer on the film. Again, other ways to get some compensation into the hands of the people who are actually doing the creative work could be receiving credit as a producer uh, and, comp and shares of revenues or something. Um, sometimes it's just co-productions between many several companies that all bring something of value to the party. So producer A buys the screenplay, starts developing it. Producer B has a first look deal with you know, some star who they want to put in the lead role. So now those two companies are co-producing. Then they need to bring on this other element and that's 
controlled by or, or, or streamlined by the virtue of some other re production company's relationships. And so you see, yeah, they, they, I don't want to call them hangers on because they're actually bringing real value, but yeah, people come along and you, you, you pick up producers as you go. And then, uh, when it comes out, they all want to have their name on the screen. So, so Lee in theater, the studio is the, is the lead producer kind of, uh, that, and then talk a little bit about, about the, um, the fundraising, the fundraising for theater. I, I, I don't, I don't like fundraising to me always means not for profit, uh, the money raising for theater. Sure. Well, I'll sort of jump ahead to having a producer who's optioned the work, who's actually mounting a commercial production and is bringing in investors. So in, on the theater side of things, the producer would, would try to get investors to invest money in the show. And the, there's the, what they would use, or at least what's most commonly used, I think, by almost all producers, is what's called a Rule 506B for Boy Regulation D Private Placement Offering. So you're basically doing an offering of securities. You are selling investment to investors. And it's a private placement offering as opposed to a public offering. So the public offering, like you have a, a company that goes public that is selling shares to everybody out there, that's very, very highly regulated by the SEC. But so you don't want to do that for theater because it gets very complicated, very expensive. In theater, you do what's called a private placement offering. So you're going to be offering things to people with whom you have a pre-existing relationship. So it could be family member, could be spouse, could be an ex, could be friends, could be friends of friends. And it's sort of a, a game of, I'd like, say, six degrees of Kevin Bacon. You know someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows someone, I think I'll you one more, who knows someone who has money. And that's why a lot of producers will use co-producers to go to their networks and bring, and bring their people in to invest money. So you do this private placement offering, and it's money, it's money that you collect from what's called a passive investor. A passive investor is someone who has no meaningful participation in the decision-making for the show, as opposed to an active investor, someone who does have dis that decision-making power, which would really be the, the lead producers of the show. And even and sort of like in film, you sometimes have lead producers coming together to co-lead produce a show, and they enter into a, into a, a co-production joint venture agreement is what I call it. And they, they sort of promised each other, or to at least use best efforts, to raise equal shares of the show's capitalization, of capitalization being the money that's needed to pay for all the production expenses to get the show to the first performance. So you'd use, you'd use a securities offering to do that. And there are some, there are some documents that are involved. It's, it's very important to do things right. The key to it is to disclose things to your investors that they know that they're making an informed decision in deciding to, to invest the money in the show because we all know that investing money in theater is crazy. Who would want to do that? Well, obviously people who love theater, people who, who have the money to put in, some people who want to get tax losses. That they can I, have a, I have a tricky question. Um, we, we know, uh, Gordon yes. and Lee, we know that in theater, um, people are more than likely not going to get their investment back. Um, what percentage of movies do, the, do investors make money on, Gordon? Wow. Uh, you know, I'm not sure I know the statistic on that. I think it's similarly risky, uh, maybe even more so because there are a lot of... Except well, for of one questions. thing. There's one, there's one big difference. There are many a physical asset. It's a physical asset. Theater is, is just performance by performance. Mm -hmm. uh, it opens, it closes, that's, that's the end until somebody does another production. Film is a, is, a, is a physical asset that you have that you can continue to find ways to distribute. You can continue to find ways of finding revenue streams for, for a film. Um, it's not going to close. The yeah. film's not going to close. So I want to, I want to touch on something Lee was saying, and then I will respond to that because okay. I, I do have a thought about that. But um, in the the syndicated securities offering methodology that Lee described that is you know by far the most common in the theater arena is also very very common in the lower budget range film projects so that's the the under 20 million dollars I, I love to do them on the under five million kind of budgets same exact model go out get get those investors under that 506 B reg D offering and and uh, and do the same thing and those films it's about as risky for uh, as a theater piece and again we tell the investors all the reasons why they shouldn't invest because they're gonna lose their money unless it's a ginormous success and they invest anyway because like theater investors because they believe in the piece they believe in the art or they believe in the people and oftentimes it's about making art whether or not it's profitable is that a fair statement Lee yes okay okay thank you 
So to, now to respond to what you were saying, Bob, about the physical asset being the differentiating factor, the truth of it is if a play on Broadway flops because nobody came to see it, it's, it didn't appeal to the public you know, sentiment or whatever at the time. If a film f flops, it's for the same reason. People didn't want to see it. And so having that physical asset that, yes, you can sell it later, and yes, there's always a possibility that it becomes a sleeper hit or something like that, that again is a very rare circumstance. So a flop at the box office or a flop on the first year's streaming or home video it, it, or God, you know, God forbid nobody ever even picks it up for streaming or home video. Yeah, it's nice. You've got this can of film sitting on a shelf somewhere, but it, it isn't doing anything but costing you storage space most of the time. So, um, yes, the investors feel like they own something that can be turned to account. But in reality, now, I don't think that's that common. Now, Gordon, I've, I've seen offerings for, for small films mm -hmm. that have, to my, to my eye, I haven't seen much difference between an offering for a play they, they look almost the same very similar, um, very similar. Yeah. are there are there any differences that i should that i should pay attention to well uh, you know with a, with a play when the show closes and everything's been sold you know you can actually close up and wind up the company when you have that tangible asset what happens when you're ready when the company is no longer generating any revenues you still got that asset still got investors who have an interest in it you may not be able to close down the company. So there's some things in the in the uh, offering documents that we will try to use to address that and fig, you know, determine how that's going to be handled. Um, the, the one thing that you'll see in the business plan for a film that you can't, you just can't put into a theater, a theater piece is the distribution channels and what the projections from various different sources and international and those kinds of things so there are there are some I, I would call that more technical differences in the the flow of the money but uh no fundamentally the the offerings are very similar what Bob, are the... do you mind if I, do you mind if i ask gordon a quick question go ahead gordon you mind if i ask you a quick question i don't mind i was just curious because uh, obviously for theater for the offering documents there's going to be an operating agreement for the limited liability company yeah. generally used and a subscription agreement um I've seen in films sometimes that rather than doing those two offering separate offering documents, they just do a film investment agreement, which I guess sort of brings in the risk factors and things like that. Is that done a lot in your experience that you've seen? And, and if so, I'm wondering, hmm, why don't we do that in theater? You know, maybe because of my um, involvement in theater, I am not very fond of that approach. And I, I worry that that so, quote investment agreement doesn't really tick all the boxes to satisfy the securities regs. Um, what I do see sometimes is this sort of hybrid operating agreement in lieu of a, P, a private placement where it's all built into one document. And I think that works. Uh, I think, um, um, well, you know, the, the elder statesman of theater law, Don Farber, had developed that model, actually. So, um, uh, so yeah, and that works on both sides of this. I what I'm Donald. starting to, what's that? I miss Donald. Yeah. He was a good friend. Oh, yeah. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting him a couple of times, didn't know him well, but uh, yeah, a true gentleman as well. So um, what I'm seeing now on both sides, actually, is is something that I hadn't heard of very much until just recently called a safe, simple agreement for future equity. Sort of like a front money deal where they're lending you some cash to get started with the project and then maybe it'll convert into an equity investment kind of a structure, but I'm seeing people trying to use it as the only financing engine. And I'm not sure how I feel about that, to be really honest. But if you're raising a couple it, hundred thousand, it can work. I hope it lives up to its name. Uh, I only learned of that, that acronym, if you will, just a yeah. couple months ago. So honestly, don't Same know here. exactly what it is, mm. but I will not let it cause fear in my heart. <laughs> I've got to figure out what it is first before I can condemn it. I've seen it used by like apartment building developers that are, they need to buy the land before they can get the financing to build the building. So they do the safe with one entity or something like that kind of thing. So theoretically it, it would be a, a front money deal. So the other, th the other, an another big difference, uh, and you mentioned, you sort of touched on it, Lee, was is distribution. Uh, we haven't really talked about the distribution uh, part of, of the, of the film um, business mm -hmm. model. Um, what, what would what would what would there be there's no real uh equivalent in theater i mean there is no theater distribution uh, unless you look at look at licensing as being a form of future distribution a spin-off tour maybe yeah 
So, okay, so subsidiary rights in, in, in theater and in film, we have um, distribution, I guess. Well, it, but distribution uh, is so it's so it's so inherent to to the success of, of the of the the property. Yeah. Uh, if it's not distributed, it's not seen. Right. Right. One of the interesting things about distribution is that that it can play a role in the uh, in the financing structure because it's possible to pre-sell the film into distribution. It's not as common as it used to be, but uh, some people might have heard the term negative pickup deal as a as a style of financing, and that is actually a a bank financing debt financing of the film on the basis of having pre-sold all of the different distribution territories to accumulate enough promises of money when you deliver the film we'll give you this much money that the bank will lend you that money in order to make the film and deliver it and that's where you get into all of these other moving parts the insurance sounds, companies sounds so nice until you try to do it well it is it is challenging but it, it can and, and often has been done but you've got to cover you know the bank loan they never lend you the full amount it's discounted you got to get something to cover the gap that's often an investor or investors that do that you've got insurance companies you've got a bond company that's in place to take over the film if something goes wrong and it looks like it's going crazy out of control over budget or does doesn't get finished so that it's sort of everybody's willing to take a tiny little risk and and hope that it doesn't come to them you know um so that that's one of the most complicated styles of production financing out there. Um, I'm going to open up, open it up to questions. So let's start with, with Jeffrey Lyle Siegel, who had his hand up earlier. Um, hey guys, nice to see you, Jeffrey. By the way, nice to see you, you too, yeah. Gordon. Uh, so my question here has to do with uh, underlying rights and what the difference is between. Uh, film and theater, and from an authorial point of view. Just to briefly go over this, I had something blow up in my face recently where I tried to acquire the rights to adapt a biography to a stage play, and where it became problematic, first of all, as the author, since there was no producer, I was trying to craft this in terms of produce, producerial terms as well, and it was being tied to future production opportunities. And uh, secondly, the question of how and where it was going to be produced was an issue for the rights holder. So can you all talk a little bit about how you would approach that differently in theater or film, acquiring underlying rights for an author seeking to create an adaptation that he can then sell as a screenplay or a stage play? Sure, well, uh, underlying rights, the name of the agreement is underlying rights agreement. Shocking, right? And so it's, and it, they can be very, very heavily negotiated I know because I have a couple of headache deals right now and uh, they've been gone for months and months and months. But basically you need to get the rights from the underlying property, underlying rights property owner. So let's say you wanted to take a film and, can, and turn it into a musical. So you would need to get underlying rights probably from, from, from the studio, maybe from the, screen, the screenwriter as well, if you're doing the film and the screenplays, both properties. And sort of in, in general, you, you'd want to get as many rights as you can particularly for a film, it gets very, very tricky when you want to try to get rights to make a movie of the musical. That's where you really get into the weeds and, um, and things become, can become very contentious. But, but basically you would get the rights to be able to, to adapt the work into, into a show. Uh, you would try not to give approval rights if you can to the underlying rights owner over the script, although that's always a point of negotiation as well. And it comes down again to negotiating leverage bargaining power. Uh, in terms of the compensation, Usually what I've seen in underlying rights agreements, and let's take the example of a musical, is that the underlying rights owner will get a third royalty as well, meaning that the royalties for a musical book writer gets a third, the composer gets a third, the lyricist gets a third, and then the underlying, underlying rights owner would also get a third, but that third is not paid from the author's share, the third is just another royalty that gets paid by the producer. On top of that, our old friend subsidiary rights comes back into the, into the picture where any subsidiary rights income, you would, you would pay to the underlying rights under 25% is what I've been seeing in deals of, of that income. We try to get as many rights as you can, including to promote the, promote the show and do video clips and, and things like that. And then there's also gonna be that, that same merger trigger that we talked a little bit about in the option agreement context, which is at some point, a certain event will happen that'll cause the adapted show to become merged with the underlying rights material that's in the show. 
so that they continue together on that path. Uh, and then, of course, there'll be reserved rights as well, certain rights that are reserved to the underlying rights owner that they're not going to let the adapters to use or to or to option or license to a producer. So I don't know if I'm if I'm necessarily answering your question. Yeah, that's, I was going to say, Jeffrey, is that is that answer? Is that answer? No, like, it's just that where I ran into my problem was the underlying rights holder only thought that Broadway was the only appropriate distribution channel for the play. I was trying to negotiate based on, I had projected a path of development that started with, since it was during the pandemic, an online presentation. And when the underlying rights holder discovered that I wasn't going to guarantee that I would be opening on Broadway and that I wanted merger of my rights as an author to occur with the underlying rights material after a certain number of non-Broadway presentations under the notion that we may never get to Broadway, that Jeff, blew things up. All shows go to Broadway. Everybody knows that, right? That's right. That's right. So all good, all good shows. All everything's good shows a Broadway, go to Broadway show. I didn't yeah, think this agreement should be contingent upon the underlying rights holder telling me as the producer of record where and how it was going to get produced. But they I did. agree with you. I would, I, but please. I was going to say, it's really interesting that it's always the merger clause in there right. that scares off or, or ticks off the underlying rights holder because they have this idea that, well, it's mine and you can make this thing, but I'm going to still get to do whatever it is with it. If it was a film deal, they wouldn't be asking those questions because it'd be, oh, you're going to make a movie. Okay, well, once that's done, you know, probably nobody else is going to make the movie. We, you know, we're, we're transferring exclusive rights to make film. What, uh, I, I lost my train of thought, but you, anyway, Lee, I interrupted you. You were about to say something. No, we've no, actually, not we've at actually, all. We've actually turned Donald Loft Loftus into a painter now. He's, he says he's going to turn to painting now. Uh, yeah, now, now I've lost my train of thought, so I think both of our things are Can I tell an anecdote I about underlying no, rights real quick? No, 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 because no, we have to keep going. We're okay. at like 637. No, oh, no, okay. no. Um, Thank you, guys. R.K. Ar Green asks, what's the pre-lending financing called again? He, he wanted to just get that clarified. The pre-what financing? R pre R.K., is that you? R R.G., yeah. Yeah, R.K. What's the pre pre lending financing called? I guess he's left. Never mind. He's not here anymore, so we can't answer his question. Well, I mentioned front money, which is a, a more common in theater than in film, actually. Was that the safe future equity agreement? Oh, safe. Yes, that's that probably was safe. That's it. Yeah, um, I'll have to tell him if he if he if he uh, asks me if he emails me. <laughs> Lee Roscoe, you have a question. Yes, this is very Bush League, but I'm I'm just curious. I had a regional theater that optioned a play of mine for a premiere. It was supposed to be live and on stage. Because of COVID, it went to an online production. And they um, basically asked me to give back uh, the $2,000 that they had bought the option rights with um, because they said it, it's not going to be on stage. I didn't have a lawyer to represent me and I gave it back and they paid me a couple of hundred bucks for the online um, uh, presentation. And I was wondering whether I, <laughs> I would have been entitled to keep that option money because they failed you know, their end of the bargain basically. I applaud your magnanimity. Yes, I was going to say. Oh, uh, really? I was <laughs> an idiot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You could as, as easily have said, great, I'll give you the 2000 bucks, and the screen rights are 5000 Okay. Um, and the other thing was they then ran it longer than the contract that we had, had negotiated for. I didn't dare sue them because it's local, and I don't want to get a horrible reputation you know how you're between a rock and a hard place in a case like that because so i think the answer what, to your question is yes you could have kept the two thousand dollars <laughs> and yes i could have sued them had they mm. because they continued yeah. past my contract to show the piece um i think maureen condon uh, maybe wants okay. to ask the question that she asked earlier about about a song mm. is that right maureen sure yes thank you um if a song is used in a as a theme song in a movie um and the author has not only written the song but produced the, the recording of it can that um be sold separately on itunes or can this can the author offer it to another major league singer as a cover or is it merged no it's it, under copyright law there's a specific provision that deals with songs and 
cover recordings are allowed. It's there's a compulsory license. You don't even have to ask permission. As long as you pay the royalties that are set out in the in the law, you can make and and sell cover recordings. You probably couldn't use it in some other ways, but um, but uh, just a straight ahead cover record that you know another artist recording the song is absolutely okay. Jane is reminding me that I promoted you as the podcast attorney, um, and I did actually mean to get to podcasts. Sure. Can you do a quick rundown on podcasts and how all that works and who who has the rights and, uh, in thirty wow. seconds? <laughs> well, you know, podcasting is another form of media creation, and it, it, right now we're in a in a period where it's still very grassroots. There are larger companies coming into the into the game. Um, nobody has fully figured out how we monetize these things and so on. But from the legal standpoint, you're creating a media piece of some sort and you've got the same issues. Do you need underlying rights? Do you need to um, license the song that you want to use as the theme song or, or that you're going to talk about on the show? So we have lots of copyright issues, lots of contract issues that come up. I'll tell you the, the most common thing I'm seeing as a lawyer these days is disputes between people who started a podcast together and then can't see eye to eye on the direction it's going or one's leaving or one hasn't been carrying his weight or those kinds of things. And so a lot of this is, you know, basic business stuff. You wouldn't dream of launching a theatrical production or a major film without having some contracts in place. But podcasters just, let's just, I've got a barn. <laughs> let's put on a show. So can, Bob, can I follow up? Yes. It's Jane. Yeah. Just curious about, you know, when you're, when you produce a play on stage, sub rights are fairly well documented and agreed to. What kind of sub rights do you offer if investors are supporting a, a theatrical podcast? Um, what kind of sub rights generally are are available? And generally, maybe a too broad a word since there aren't a lot of well uh, shows being done as podcasts. But yeah, I mean, we we talked thanks. a couple of weeks ago. There was a, a session that, that dealt with this a little bit. I think. Um, you know, a theater a theater piece that's being adapted as a podcast um, is a. I think it's a separate kind of a production. And if yes, if a theater piece has been a successful had a successful run on second class or first class level, then yeah, I think the producers might be entitled and the and the investors might be entitled to share to a certain extent in the revenue, if any, <laughs> from the podcast. Um, but if it's if it's a new piece and you do create a podcast, the only thing I can think of the, that you risk is is anybody going to want to do a theater piece when it's already available out there for free as a download in iTunes? And you know you're, you're creating a different kind of a production. So um, I don't know if that answers your question or not, Jane. Whoops, it, it may be a maybe a longer conversation to have. Yeah. But you know, subsidiary rights. Is, for this. Yeah, yeah, but subsidiary rights is really any subsequent adaptations or or uses of the material, unless you articulate something that's not included in the subsidiary rights category. For example, if the if the um, if it's already been a film, then you know, film rights aren't going to be a part of the subsidiary rights that the producer participates in. Is there a general contract between the podcast producer and the, and the writer? Is there something that has been formalized yet or is it just all up in the air right now? Um, most of the time when there's a, a, a writer who's separate from the producer, the deals are looking very much like a television writer deal. And so it, it's, they're being hired. It's a work for hire. It's an audio visual work and, and it belongs to the producer. The, hire, the, the writer's just getting paid a, a writing fee. Sometimes a percentage of profits or something like that. What if what if the the writer has created a um, a podcast series and they were looking for a distributor and they they go to a podcast distributor some some sort of platform. So, like... podcast distribution doesn't cost anything. It, you know, anybody who wants to create a podcast can launch it tomorrow. So, there might be yeah if if a, if a person creates a show and takes it over and Spotify wants to buy it as an exclusive or Audible wants it as one of their projects, then yeah, there's going to be some money changing hands and the writer ought to be in that deal unless they've made a lousy deal with the producer. <laughs> well, I think uh, 645 is, is, is well <laughs> late, late enough for, for you guys. Um, I want to thank you. Uh, I, I, I know that there are 
maybe other questions in the room, but I'm going to I'm going to uh, say goodbye to, the, to my YouTube viewers right now, and we can come back and if if Gordon and Lee can stay a little bit, there might be some time for you guys to all have conversations with these guys. I'm not sure if there will be or not, but um, Gordon, thank you for coming in all the way from LA. <laughs> Boy, are my arms tired. <laughs> yeah, really. And Lee, um, good to see you. Um, thank you for your information and for your help and for uh, putting up with, with my not, I guess I, 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 I guess I asked the right, I hope I asked the right questions. You know, it, this is legal stuff, so it's. You absolutely did. You're always so, a consummate host. Consummate or not, uh, or consummate. Consummated? I'm not, I like soup right now. Um, Constant gardener, something like that. Yeah. Um, so I want to just say uh, thank you to everybody who's been with us today. Uh, thank you to everybody in the room. Um, YouTube viewers, if you want to be in the room and you want to actually ask questions and be part of the conversation, uh, just email me at trunltd at aol.com. That's trunltd at aol.com. And um, we'll put you on a list and we'll invite you every week. And the weeks that you have... We're having something that is of interest to you. You'll you'll join us, and other, otherwise, you can watch us on YouTube again. So, uh, and the other thing I want everybody to know is that we do this for uh, as a service to the community, and we're perfectly happy to have everybody come here for free. And we call it pay what you can, and pay what you can does have an implied meaning of if you can pay, then pay. So uh, we appreciate any donations that you can give us to support us and, to, and support the work we're doing. Um, the community gatherings are going to continue virtually uh, indefinitely. They're just going to—I'm just going to do them. I, I don't want to lose my my international audience. So, uh, but we're going to start doing live performance on July 25th. We're actually producing a new play, uh, reading of a new play called Greenwood by Coolidge Harris II. It's part of a new program that we're launching called True Diversity, where we're trying to be more supportive and understanding of the needs of, of diversity and. And equity in, in this in our business. Um, the me the reason I mentioned going live is because it's it at least triples our expenses. So although we're healthy and stable financially right now, uh, as we go into the live world, we're going to have more and more expenses, and we are, are going to need people to be as supportive as you possibly can. If you can't, that's fine. We love you and we love having you here. Come for free. Be part of the community. If you can give a donation, then do. It's trudonate.com. That's trudonate.com. And join us next week. Uh, I have City Council Person Chi Osei coming and uh, Amy Todorov from the League of Independent Theaters. We're going to talk about uh, something we've talked about before, uh, art and politics. We're going to talk about balancing art with politics and with activism, art and activism. You look at it in different ways. And other things coming up. Um, you can go to our website, trueonline, truonline.org, and you can click for the community gatherings and you can see a great lineup of, of guests that I have coming in the next five weeks and we'll continue to have them coming for the next 10 weeks and 15 weeks and 20 weeks. Um, we're doing this every week and Hopefully I can put th together things that you'll find of interest and you'll find helpful. That's it. Thank you for being with us.